Thanks for being here. I get to be in charge today because Jody's not here. We're really glad that you're here. If you're a guest, thanks for being here. We hope that everyone will take a minute and fill out one of the cards in the seat in front of you and put that in the collection plate later so that we can have a record of everybody's attendance. And we do have one very special guest here today for the first time, and that would be Hayden Taylor, who brought his parents, Jeff and Brittany. I'm going to ask them to come up here. You guys, come on, it is our custom at the Twick to acknowledge a newborn the first time that they come and to uh, give a little special token to the family and then to have a blessing with one of our elders over them. So would you welcome them this morning? <laughs> Bill, come on up here. Yes. And let's pray. Wow. God, we thank you for new life. We thank you for families. We thank you for uh, Jeff and Brittany and for Hayden. God, we ask your blessings upon this family. We ask your blessings upon Jeff and Brittany as they uh, have many nights where they struggle with crying babies and uh, lack of sleep. God, we pray that you'll bless them through that and uh, ask you to bless them as a family. Help us as a congregation, God, to provide an environment for this child to grow and for Jeff and Brittany's marriage to grow and for all of us to grow together as a family. Be with us all and give us your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome. Thank you. So Jody has been on reading retreat all week. He was secluded away by himself to study and read and make plans for the next year for his sermon preparation. And um, I think he just slept most of the time, but 
Hopefully, he's going to come back loaded with all kinds of new stuff to lay on us. So that's what we'll hope for. In his place this morning, we are very fortunate to have one of Jody's good friends, Ken Chaffin. Ken has been preaching for 45 years in places like Illinois, Indiana, California, Georgia, and North Carolina. He retired from the North Raleigh Church of Christ on July 1st of 2015. He then served as the Director of Development for Agape of North Carolina and currently is the Director of Development at Child Haven, Inc. And there is a table set up outside to my right in the lobby with all kinds of Child Haven information. I know he would love to see you there afterwards if you'd like more information about Child Haven and the work that they do. He holds degrees from Rochester College, Abilene Christian University, and McCormick Theological Seminary. He and his wife Janie have been married for 46 years. They have two children and five grandchildren. So Ken, where are you Ken? We're looking forward to it buddy in just a minute. And now, as we continue, let's stand and let's worship together. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign for us. You do not 
been on our side, let Israel say. If the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken. And we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the let's maker take, of heaven and earth. Let's take our offering. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, the
worship you, God. There is none like you. There is none more holy. There is none more full of grace and mercy. And we know that as we celebrate the giving of your son. And we worship you because of what you've done for us in our sinful nature. Giving us a chance to be redeemed, to have salvation. But through a sacrifice that was cruel and painful. And so we offer our thanks for the body of Jesus as we share it at this time. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name and all that agree say, amen. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent Him from your side to walk God, again, we're reminded of your love for us. May we truly appreciate being washed in the blood. Blood that cleanses and saves and gives life. We thank you for the Lamb of God. We thank you for the sacrifice. We ask you to bless us as we again take it together. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name and all that agree say. Amen.
Your gift of love, <coughs> they crucified. They left us pale as he died. The humble king, they named the throne and sacrificed the Lamb of God. <coughs> oh, Steps are sometimes tricky for old men. Um, good morning, Twickingham. I just cut myself on your chair. So I walked into a friendly face this morning. I'm grateful for that. Uh, Mike and Jeannie Worley are back here with their daughter. Um, they were with us at... Uh, I was for 10 years the pulpit minister at Purdue University in Lafayette, Indiana. It's actually called the Elmwood Church. Uh, and it's always nice to walk in someplace and somebody from Purdue comes up to see you. Because it was a great student ministry there and we were delighted to have them with us. I'll tell you a quick story that sort of helps this, define this. My first gig with Child Haven, and Lincoln's already giving you the commercial so I don't have to. Um, but my first gig with Child Haven was at a little church called Grand Haven down south of Evergreen, all the way down 65, 45, 50 miles south of Montgomery. And out in the sticks, gravel roads, little group of about 40 faithful people. Every year we go down there with our truck and our trailer, and they fill us up with canned goods, with clothes, with paper towels and toilet paper and all the necessities that you need to run a residential program like we do at Child Haven. And um, 
I had done the Sunday school class and explained what we were involved with and how things were going. And I got up now to give the sermon. I had gotten two sentences into the sermon. Two. And the old fellow who was sort of the leader of the church raises his hand. Now, I'm not used to taking questions during sermons. <laughs> he said, young man, that was funny. Young man, he said, uh, before you even get started, we need to know a very, very important answer to a question that I'm about to give you. And I said, oh my, in my head, what kind of doctrinal mess has Jim got me into? And he said, right now we need to know, is it Roll Tide or War Eagle? <laughs> to which I bowed my head for a minute, raised it back up and said, with all due respect in the world, it's Go Boilers. <laughs> um, he said, well, that's a fine school too. And I accepted his, <laughs> I accepted his acceptance. Wasn't prepared for that, folks. I really wasn't. Not in the middle of the church service. Um, you guys love your football. I bring you greetings from, from Dr. Jim Wright and Debbie, who really considers Twickenham one of several churches that he considers home churches in his life. That's a good thing to do as an executive director is to have several home churches um, along the way. But things are going well at Child Haven. We're we're doing great, we're trying to expand. We just hired some new house parents. Uh, we're now moving from uh, four, four cottages with children in them to uh, six cottages with children in them and we're grateful for that and for what God is doing. Thanksgiving Appeal is coming up. If you wanna help us with that, we would appreciate it. We already know the kind of support that Twickenham has given us and still gives us on a regular basis uh, out of your church treasury and we're grateful for that. We're trying to do the work of the kingdom there. We appreciate your prayers and all the financial support you can give. Okay, that's the commercial. Well, you're getting the second string this morning, uh, literally the second string, and I'm going to explain that as well. Uh, in 1988, I was leaving La Mesa, California, San Diego area, because we didn't like it in California and we wanted to come back east where the, where the land did not shift, um, where we were no longer in the land of fruits and nuts, and um, <laughs> back to the solidity that we found so comforting east of the Mississippi River. Uh, I had two churches call me from Atlanta. One was a little startup group called East Cobb and Marietta. The other was a much larger and prestigious church uh, on the campus of Greater Atlanta Christian School and therefore called the campus church. We were at Marietta the first, time, the first week and spent the week there and then came back to campus for the second interview the following weekend. Uh, the elders of the church at campus, and we had already see, received the offer from, from East Cobb, the elders at the church at campus when we left on that Sunday said, don't do anything with East Cobb until after next week. And I said, okay. And they said, we think that you're the guy, but we have this young fellow who's still in his 20s, who's coming to join us next Sunday. He actually went to school here at GAC, and, and we feel like that we owe him the opportunity to speak to us and, and talk to him next weekend, so don't do anything. I said, fine. A week and a half goes by, and the phone rings, and it's the elder from, uh, from campus, and he says, I'm sorry to tell you this, Brother Chaffin, but uh, we've chosen the fellow who was in with us over the weekend. He just came in and knocked our socks off. That young man was Jody Vickery. <laughs> so as you can tell, I am truly second string. Uh, Jody and I became fast friends as we preach together in Atlanta, and I'm delighted to be here. We visited with you incognito twice already this year uh, to come and just simply hear him preach. He's one of my favorite preachers in the whole world, actually. So when he called a couple of weeks ago and told me what he was doing and asked me to come preach, not do child haven, but come, come preach, my wife says I only have one sermon these days. Um, 
I said I'd be delighted. So would you pray with me, please? Father, bless us now as we enter into your word. Help us to know and to see all that you are doing within our lives and help us to make a difference in the way that we live. Help us to be kingdom people, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Matthew chapter 20, one of the most inscrutable parables that Jesus tells. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a, depart, uh, excuse me, a denarius for the day and sent them out into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again upon the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. In about the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around, and he asked them, why are you standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each of them received a denarius. So when those came, when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired and worked only one hour, they said, who have been, who have been made equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I do, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? So take your pay and go. I want you to give the man who was hired the last, I want to give the man who was hired the last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? And so the last will be first and the first will be last. The New Yorker magazine a number of years ago had a cartoon that I think I still have in some file that has not yet been opened since we moved. It's a father who is slumped in an easy chair, uh, who obviously has had a long day at work, but he has his beverage on his side table. He's attempting to relax when his rather precocious 10-year-old son, who is playing right next to him, comes up with this thought. Say, Pop, where are you in the pecking order? It is precisely that kind of question that Matthew is trying to answer to the small group of people that he is working with or that he is attached to or to whom he's writing his gospel. Matthew's church suffered a very serious problem. They were scrambling for status. A church that was throwing their weight around sometimes, trying to secure the slots that were in their particular pecking order. Others finagled for certain power positions and everyone was trying to manipulate or reward or find some reward for themselves that was better than someone else's. So Matthew tackles this problem with the answer to the question of what do loyal, hardworking Christians really deserve and what they get. And as usual in Matthew's gospel, Peter plays the heavy. Now what's this passage really trying to tell us? Because it is perplexing, particularly for those of us who live in a capitalistic society and expect that if you work harder, you will get more along the way. I think that it's trying to tell us where the payoff is and where the pecking order lies in the kingdom that is the Lord's vineyard. How do we approach it? What's the key to its understanding? I've always been fascinated by this because it's, it's not seemed fair to me. Does it seem fair to you that the guys who get uh, who come very, very late to the game are getting the same reward as the people who were there before them uh, and who started very, very early in the morning. But we need to ask ourselves what's happening here. For all of his being near Christ's vineyard, Peter is still hacking around and bucking for privilege because it's in that section of scripture where they're debating who's the greatest in the kingdom and who's going to get the highest place in heaven. Peter has hooked his identity, his security, to the bonuses, to the ratings, to the report cards, 
to the society columns, to the power slots, and to all those things that we seem to give credence to within our world as we see it today. We know Peter. We've been Peter. He wants the uh, parking place that is closest to the office. He wants the low-numbered license plate. He wants the fancy overhead. He wants the initials after his name. He's angling for the honorary degree, the, the prefix that might set him apart from someone else. By the way, you can call me right reverend. Um, in all fairness, of course, he deserves it. He's been with Jesus since the beginning. But doesn't this sound familiar? The world outside of Christ's vineyard where offices and titles and residences and credentials mean all the world to those of us who simply look at them and say, boy, that must be some guy because he has all those things behind his name. Most of our families are familiar with it as well. Uh, we find ourselves struggling from time to time with what it means to ask ourselves the question, am I important enough within this particular situation? Uh, I can go back to the days when Stephen and, and Bethany were children and the conversations would run like this. Hey, Dad, I cleaned the garage last summer, so I don't have to do dishes tonight, right? Uh, who gets the bathroom first today? Is it your turn or is it my turn? And all this ordering takes place within our lives that helps us understand who's really important and who isn't along the way. Well, if we're wondering whether or not it's important to be a descendant of the Mayflower or not, I can tell you right now, it doesn't matter in Christ's kingdom. The idea of looking at all that I have done or trying to find a special case for myself because I am the one who is the most important, that's far and apart and away from those things which Jesus teaches. So enter Matthew in his stunning parable. He has an alternative. Matthew offers us a different kind of reality that we can live in, a kind of reality that makes all the difference of the world in terms of Jesus, where all things that are pecking orders and all things that are merit systems are dissolved. You hear that? They're dissolved. They go away. They don't matter. Not in the kingdom of God. He's saying that to spend ourselves in turning the human race into the human family is the most important thing. To work and to labor in the vineyard where Christ is and where we walk and we talk with him and we work beside him as well engenders a new, albeit mysterious, reward. The commitment of our lives to Christ's new creation, whether it be here in Huntsville or down in Coleman or over in Atlanta, is now a new idea or reality that we deal with. We are to be engaged in a work of such nobility and grace that Matthew can only describe it as a touch of heaven. When and if we come late to join others in their servant task in the vineyard, or of course, or whether or not we receive the same wages they do, it doesn't really matter. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. These gifts that come to us of the love, the joy, the courage that it, it takes to live life, these are the rewards that we are seeking after. And what are they? The early, the early birds that come to the kingdom or the vineyard should not begrudge the latecomers to their reward as well. Where have you been? What took you so long is what we ought to be saying. It's about time that you joined the, the bandwagon. We, we're grateful to have you, but we wish that you had come sooner along the way. And those among us who arrive late, what can we say but where has this been all of my life? How have I missed this? In what way or another have I not seen the wonder and the glory of what it means to follow in Christ's way? Show me the needs. Where can I help? Give me the trenches. Help me to serve. These are the kinds of things that Isaiah talks about when he is first confronted with his prophetic call in Isaiah 6. And it's the same kind of things that confront us as well when Jesus comes into our life and we see him so powerfully along the way. I want to suggest to you that the service of Christ pays off in a different way from pretty much every other thing in our lives. Not as Peter wanted it. He's not going to get the title of senior disciple or chief apostle. He's not going to get the headline in the Galilean news, he is the volunteer of the year. He's not going to find himself with titles 
or anything else after his name. The payoff comes for him and it comes for us as well. Whenever, whenever we stumble into Christ's vineyard and we seize the work and do the opportunities that the Lord puts before us. It consists simply of the peace and the joy, the strength and the power of what it means to work with him along the way. I would take this actually even one step further. I would suggest to you that most of the reward, there's a great one coming, I admit, but a lot of the reward is in the process of working with him in the vineyard itself. That the payoff is, is that we get to work with Jesus in terms of what we ought to be doing and how it is that we ought to be serving. So that each night as we lay our head on our pillow, we say to ourselves, today has been a day that has been part of the kingdom life for me. Today is a day in which I have seized the opportunities that have been put before me. Today is a day that I have received the joy of what it means to work with Jesus. In the sweat and the heat of the day, in the coolness of the evening, in the times that were hard when the dirt was tough, in the times that were easy when we fellowshiped and sang, all of these things are a part of what it means to have the reward. Maybe that's what he meant when he said that I've come to give you life abundant and to give it to you now. Ours is not just a pie-in-the-sky religion. And it may not seem fair to us along the way that those who come late to the party are given the same reward, but the reward is in the work. The joy is in the service. That feeling of correct pride when you know that you have finished the day as the Lord's servant and him as your king. I am convinced that, that Matthew's story here is told to his church so they, they might throw out the pecking order in the merit system and find again the reward that is truly theirs, which is the joy of serving with him along the way. And so the, pro, the, excuse me, the parable does not become any more such nearly a struggle to interpret because it seems so unfair to those of us who live in the systems that we live in. But rather we can see the different reality that Jesus makes within our lives along the way. All of these things come to us with a Christ who sustains us, who lifts us up, who gives us a cup of cool water, even in the heat of the day. And the reward consists in us realizing that we are standing, and I like this imagery, shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. Part of what it is to do his will and his work within this way. The kingdom reality is, is that we're to change this world into the kingdom. It can't be done unless I understand that the reward is in doing what it is that he has called me to do. So, my soul, what a payoff for you, for me, for all of our churches, for those who wish to climb on board at any time. It is a reward that says that the solidarity, the camaraderie, the joy of serving Jesus and alongside of him is greater than any other reality that we've ever known. There's an old dog-eared songbook in the Psalter, Psalm 120 through Psalm 134, 15 songs, that are part of what we believe to be the songbook of Israel as it marched on its way to Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate the feasts of God. I have studied the Psalms of Ascent for the last 20 years. It never goes, grows old for me. It's, it's, it's been for me the regular hymnal of my life, very frankly. Some great words are found there. We sang some of them earlier this morning from the passage that was read. What it is, is what I like to call bus songs. Do you remember when we were young, some of us anyway, uh, who when we were young and churches had those old bluebird buses that transported us from here to there to everywhere. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and we, we would go to gospel meetings and we'd go to youth rallies and we'd climb on the bus. And we'd enjoy one another's company and fellowship as we traveled over the streets of, of uh, southern Michigan to get whatever, wherever it was that we went. What did we do? 
Well, we would talk and we would tell jokes and we would pat each other on the back. But more often than not, we sang. We sang songs, we sang VBS stuff, we sang all sorts of music to get from one point to the other. Psalm 120 through Psalm 134 were the bus songs of Israel. They're the ones that they sang along the road, along the journey. I actually believe that they are their messages of discipleship to those early people who believed and trusted in God as they marched on their way to get to where they could. As one of the Psalms says, it's good to come together to go to Jerusalem to worship. It's good to go to church. I tell you that just simply to say that this whole thing is a journey. This whole thing is a vineyard. This whole thing is about work and service. God did not come to make you comfortable. He came to give you opportunity to make a kingdom greater and bigger than it's ever been before. It has its own brightness. It's up to us to illuminate it along the way. And I believe that what Matthew 20 is trying to say is, is that in the journey, wherever it is that we're going and however it is that we're traveling, that the joy and the reward is in the work. Will you pray with me, please? Father, we get so confused in our times about uh, things that are important. Our priorities get changed. We begin to think that somehow those things that the world says are important are important, and we forget that you are the most important. We pray that you will forgive us when those times have come. We pray that you will bless us as we seek your glory within our lives and within our hearts. We pray that you will keep us from looking at things and stuff in this world that would threaten to undo us. Help us instead to know that you are on our side. Help us to know instead that the work lies before us and help us to be laborers together in the vineyard. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, Ken. And there are so many good works, and we know that Child Haven's one of them, and we appreciate the things that you guys do um, down there. Uh, this morning, a few things as we close. There is a wedding shower today for Ellen Horton and Chad DC. That's 1.30 to 3. It's in the Mercy Building. Um, the information about where they're registered is in your bulletin. Also, uh, Saturday, November the 4th, is our Aging Well Ministry Fair, which is really a great concern to many of us here and in our entire culture. And um, I know that they'll have some great information, so make plans to think about attending uh, that seminar from 8 until noon on uh, November the 4th. Uh, this coming Sunday night is our annual Trunk or Treat, probably the biggest community event that we do all year long. And so uh, we want to see the cars and the trunks and the candy and all that good stuff. Um, Sunday night we'll have chili starting at 5 o'clock, so join us for that. And then keep in mind the November 3rd prayer service, that's Friday night or Friday from noon until midnight. Prayer cards are available in the lobbies and in classrooms. Be filling those out and turning those back in as we approach that great time together of prayer on the 3rd. And thanks for being here. Let's stand together. We're going to sing that first chorus that we started with this morning, and then we'll close in prayer. Praise God, praise God, praise God who saved my soul. Father, we thank you for this time of worship and fellowship with you and our friends and our loved ones. Help us to worship you and give you the glory for all the good things that happen to us this coming week. 
We thank you so much for what your son endured for us so that we might be come adopted children of yours. It's in his name we pray. Amen.